how many of you would add your own testimony that God is good? Has He been good to you? Would you agree with that in your life? I know that that's the testimony of so many of us, and we're so grateful to Miss Kathy. She's one of us. She's family. We're grateful that she's with us this morning, grateful that she's sharing this truth with us today. And it is true that God is good. I want us to think today, though, that we live in a world full of people who do not believe that God is good. We live in a world full of people who do not believe that Jesus is what they need in their life. They, they may not believe that they're sinners. They may not believe that um, Jesus is the answer, or the, the way to be saved. They may not believe that Jesus is how you get to heaven. There's lots of things they may choose to not believe. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to dive in for four Sundays, beginning today, for four Sundays into one particular parable that Jesus teaches. Jesus teaches the parable of the sower and the seed. It's a parable that's familiar to us, but I think it's worth our time to, little, to chew on, just a little bit, some of the meaning of this parable. Um, as we think about this parable, Matthew 13, beginning in verse 1, um, or verse 3, we're going to get to the parable in a moment. But I want you to understand something that's happening here. Jesus is a parable teller. In fact, one of Jesus' primary methods of teaching is not maybe just a sermon. He did that, certainly. Sermon on the Mount, for example, Matthew chapter 5, 6 and 7. A sermon where he's giving information and helping us to understand who God is and how God works in the kingdom of God. Well, then one of the other things he loved to do was tell parables. But Jesus had specific reasons he liked to tell parables. His stories had a lesson inside them. And some people would listen to the story and understand the message, understand the lesson. Some people would hear the story and would not respond. They would not engage. They wouldn't understand. They would leave confused. So Jesus would tell the parable, and two kinds of people, actually in this uh, story here, there's four different kinds of responses. So there's lots of different kinds of responses to when Jesus told a parable. He would tell a parable, and the parable would be heard by lots of ears, but there would be lots of different responses to the same story that they all heard. And we'll hear the same story. We have it in a written form. We're grateful to Matthew and Mark and Luke who will tell this parable. We're grateful for that. But we're going to listen with lots of different ears. And if you told the story of Jesus to lots of people in your lifetime, you should expect that not everybody's going to respond in the same way to the message you have to share. If you're going to get a chance to say, Jesus has changed me, Jesus loves you, you could, your life could be different. If you get a chance to say that to somebody, you should not expect the same response from all of the different people you get a chance to say that to. You should expect different responses. You should expect that some people are into it and some people are going to tolerate it. And Jesus explained to us ahead of time, that's kind of the way the world works. This is the way it was expected. And Jesus, preacher of all preachers, would preach messages and people would reject what he had to say. So if Jesus is going to say things and be rejected, we should not expect that when we share good news with somebody that they think it's good news. We shouldn't expect different results from what Jesus received. We should expect that if it happened to Jesus, it might happen to us in some way similar. Let's look in Matthew 13. But let's, let's look first at verse 10. Matthew chapter 13, verse 10. Jesus is going to explain why he does parable teaching ministry. He explains why. The disciples came to him, Jesus, and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, To you, disciples, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For the one, to the one who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But to the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. 
This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, well, they do not hear, nor do they understand. He'll quote from Isaiah 6 here. Indeed, their case, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says this. You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn. And I would heal them. Jesus goes on to say, But blessed disciples are your eyes, for they see. And for your ears, for they hear. For truly, I say to you, many prophets and righteous people, they longed to see what you see, and they did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but they did not hear it. So again there, and he's going to go on to explain the parable of the sower. He takes a moment, he has given a parable, he's given a story in Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 through 9. He's done that, and then after that's over, the crowd at large had varying responses. Certainly Jesus was interesting. Certainly he would have been trending on social media. Certainly there would have been a crowd following. Certainly he would have been intriguing. But not everybody cared about what he said. And the disciples are like, why, why do you do this? Like, you're just running around telling random stories. Why? Why are you doing it this way? You know, you could just really speak plainly to people. Like, you could just really just say what you mean to people. It sort of sounds like you're just kind of saying what is a story, and you're not really saying what you mean. I don't, I don't quite understand why you would choose to do that. Like, it makes more sense, maybe, if you would just be direct and just say what you're trying to say to everybody. And Jesus is like, they're not ready to hear it. Some of them. They, they will... The words that I say will enter their ears, but it won't sit on their heart. The things they watch me do will get into their eyes, but their heart will be confused by what they see. They won't be able to make sense of what just happened. I mean, we, we understand what Jesus is talking about, don't we? We understand that in a crowd of Thousands, thousands who were fed by the hands of Jesus, five loaves and two fish. Thousands saw that moment happen, and it was a miracle of God. And you know what kinds of responses were had? Well, that's cool, but can he do it tomorrow at dinner? Other responses were, I don't know. I think they were just hiding all the bread and fish they had. Hey, no way it started with one kid's lunchbox. No, 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 no. They were hiding it. No, 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 no. I, I, I think this, this can't possibly... And, but some, but some watched what Jesus did and said, that's the Son of God. That, that, that's the Messiah. Some said that. Most did not. Most ate of the bread that Jesus had passed out. And did not understand what had just happened to them. We live in the same world. We live in the same world. There are people who will be healed by a miracle of the Lord in their life. But will give credit to the medicine and the doctors and the medical treatment that they receive. Don't misunderstand me. I go to the doctor too. But I am specifically saying there are times where God does something. And they'll say, it's coincidence. They'll say, it's happenstance. They'll say, their friend did it. Their loved one did it. They'll say, I just said the right thing. I just did the right thing at the right time. I happened to be at the right place at the right time. They'll just say that it was just um, uh, uh, an interesting thing. They'll be intrigued by it. And they will never look up to God and praise Him for what He did. God works miracles all the time. And does things in people's lives all the time. We can sing about the goodness of God with each other here in church all the time. And there are plenty of people who will experience something like that from God and give him zero credit. And Jesus chooses to teach in a way where he can preach the sermon. And some people get it and some people don't. And the people who don't get it at least don't fall asleep in the sermon. I mean, it's interesting. It's a story. It's kind of intriguing. But they don't get it. The light bulb doesn't turn on. The understanding doesn't come to them. 
Jesus, this is one of the methods that he has. And listen, Isaiah said it would happen this way in Isaiah 6. And Jesus said, see, Isaiah is being fulfilled right in front of your very eyes. Now look again at verse 9. Matthew 13, verse 9. Jesus is telling the parable and he says, He who has ears, let him hear. Can we take a second? <clears throat> Can you just do me a favor? Just take one of your hands, hold it out, get it ready. Can you touch your ear for me? All right, good, thank you. Touch the other one for me. I'm assuming you got two. I mean, you may not, I don't know. You have ears, right? Jesus said, he who has ears, and I would say, and additionally, because this pronoun could be used for men and women, I would say, all y'all who have ears, let them hear. Do you have ears? Well, you just showed me you have ears. Do you hear it, though? Do you really listen, though? I mean, you already know what this means. Honey, were you even listening? Kid, did you hear what I said? <laughs> Boss man, I tried to tell you. None of you said that, right? Customer, let me explain it one more time. <laughs> I'll say it again. Listen, there's a difference between words coming in your ear and understanding coming into your heart. There's just a total different thing there. And Jesus is explaining the difference in this. Listen, how Jesus told this method of what he was doing, he told a parable about parables. <laughs> you want to talk about the movie Inception, where there's a dream within a dream within a dream. Listen, this is Jesus telling a parable about parables. This is beautiful. And fascinating and worth our time. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. Jesus tells a parable about parables. Verse 3, And he told them, Jesus, many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path. The birds came, devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground. They didn't have much soil. And immediately they sprang up. Oh, they had no depth of soil, though. When the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil. Everybody say, good soil. And produced grain. Some a hundredfold. Some sixty. Some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Well, everybody within the sound of Jesus' voice heard. But did they really listen? And of course, he tells what we've already read about why he talks in parables. Look again at verse 16. Jesus tells the disciples, Listen, blessed are your eyes, they see. Blessed are your ears, they hear. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, Jesus sits the disciples down and he says, Now let me tell you what I really just said. What I really said was not the story. What I really said was the lesson. Listen, and you, you understand this, disciples. Let's talk about it for a second. Verse 18, Hear then the parable of the sower, disciples. Okay, verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, well, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yea, verse 21, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, okay, well, this is the one who hears the word, but... The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. Everybody say unfruitful. And as for what was sown on good soil, say one more time for me, good soil. And what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit. And yields, in one case, a hundredfold. In another, 60. And in another, 30. So there are many times where Jesus tells a parable, by the way, and he never explains himself. 
You'll say the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that grew up into a bush and all kinds of cool... He'll tell us a parable about how this happened in this story and he'll tell a parable about how uh, some guys were in charge of the boss's money while he went out of town and he'll tell stories about um, uh, how a Samaritan... A Samaritan? Yeah, a Samaritan helped a guy that nobody else would help. He'll just tell these parables. And he doesn't always explain what he means. This is one of the most glorious parables because Jesus gets real specific and he explains to us, let me tell you what I was saying. And he says here his explanations. So now look, when Jesus tells a parable, sometimes we take the analogy and we go a little too far. Sometimes you're trying to squeeze too much blood out of the turnip, right? Sometimes you're really trying to get the marrow out of the bones. Well, we do that because we love the Word of God. We do that because we take the Word of God seriously. But let's remember, when he tells a story, it's a story... But when he tells the explanation, there's the principles, right? So let's make sure we major on the principles, but minor on the analogy in the story. But let's look at what happens. The sower sows. How many of you have ever planted seeds of any kind? Maybe you planted seeds where you planted a tomato plant inside your house. Maybe you bought a plant. Well, that came from a seed, of course. Maybe you have a full-on garden. Uh, maybe you planted seeds because you're really hoping some deers will come along and eat the, what's growing up. Maybe you've uh, uh, used corn. That's a seed. Um, you maybe not should have used that in certain ways in hunting. But anyway, let's move on past that. Some of us uh, will use seeds for all kinds of different things. But listen, if you're planting a seed, you want it to grow. Okay? You don't throw seed out for the birds to eat. Okay, I just actually lied a little bit. Bird seed is a thing. I know. I know bird seed is a thing. And you'll feed the squirrels and the birds with that. But what I mean is if you're trying to grow something, you're planting the seed so that it will actually grow, not so that you'll feed animals with it. And if you're trying to plant, if you're trying to sow, if you're trying to make the seed grow into something, if you're trying to make that happen, then what you do not want, is for seed to land on the asphalt. You don't want it to land in the parking lot. You don't want it to land in your driveway. You don't want it to land in a path where everybody's walking. You don't want it to land somewhere where it doesn't even get in the dirt good. That's not what you want. Because what will happen when that happens is that it will never grow. And it'll never grow because birds do what birds do. They eat seeds. Look again at Matthew 13, verse 13. 18. Let's think about this for a second. Because we're talking about seeds. What even is the seed? Verse 18. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, the evil one comes and snatches away. Listen again. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, what is Jesus teaching? He's teaching, listen, this is who God is. This is what God's kingdom is like. This is how you can be a citizen of the kingdom, not of the kingdom of Rome, not of the kingdom of Israel, but of the kingdom of God Almighty. You want to be on His team? Do you want to be in His group? Do you want to be a one who says, I give allegiance to the King of Kings. His, he is the Lord God Almighty. Do you want to be on His team? Do you want it to be all about His kingdom? If God is your king and He tells you what to do and you're a good citizen, do you want to do what God tells you to do as a good citizen? So Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to us. And He uses words, words, to share the good news of the kingdom of God. But He says lots of words. And so many of the words, that is the seeds, So many of the words fall on deaf ears. Again, I mean, this is clear. You understand this. Verse 19, they hear the word of the kingdom and they do not get it, right? They don't understand it. And what happens? The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. That's the first soul. Look, we're not going to get any further than that first thing. We're going to talk about the second soul, the third soul, and the fourth soul later. Let's think about just that first one and remember what it is. The word of the kingdom. That is, Jesus' words to help people understand God. Listen, if you fast forward to 2023, we are to be about the same thing Jesus did. We have the same mission 
Not to die for the sins of mankind like Jesus did, but to sow seeds. The disciples learned this lesson from Jesus because Jesus was going to send them out gardening. He was sending them out gardening. But he was giving them the words. He was giving them the seeds. He was preparing them also. Because what you should expect, guys, when you get about the, God's, uh, about the Lord's business, what you should expect is sometimes Satan, who's the evil one, will snatch away all of your work. Isn't that discouraging? Isn't that discouraging? I mean, think how discouraging it is for you to plant a seed only to watch it disappear from what you tried to do. I mean, here you are trying, and some of that seed just doesn't make it into where you wanted it to make it to. And then you tried, and it looks like you failed. Friends, when Jesus is telling this parable to the disciples, He wants them to be prepared for the fact that they need to get about the business of sowing, but they are not in the business of growing. They are in the business of sowing. They are not in the business of growing people's lives. And what that means is they have a message, and the message needs to be told. By the way, if we're careful to show the message of Jesus with our lives, living for Jesus, living lives of integrity, and we never have anything to say about Jesus, we are not fully sharing the gospel. We're not fully sharing the gospel. You can share the gospel with how you live your life, but it is an incomplete, and it's not sowing. Sowing are words. We need to say something to somebody. We need to say Jesus loves them. We need to ask how we can pray for them. We need to ask, look for a chance, just look for a chance to have a conversation about something more than sports, about something more than how hunting's been going, about where the fish are biting, something more than about what have you seen on TV lately, something more about your favorite song, something more than just something that grabs your attention. Listen, we have the good news that can literally change people's souls. Do you know how valuable this is? This is seeds that deserves to take root in every human heart. It won't, unfortunately, take root. But it is what God desires is that all people, or that no one should perish, but that all would come to belief in Him. That's what God wants. And we better get to sowing. Now, we should expect sometimes that when we sow, Satan immediately steals it back and takes it away. And, and you, already knows what, you already know what this is like. You, you already know that this is that person that just doesn't get it. I mean, I mean, they don't understand. Like, what do you mean Jesus died for my sin? Like, I don't, I don't understand that. Well, how do, how do you know that, that, that the Bible's real? That I, don't, I don't understand that. How can you take God so seriously? Like, don't you know what you could be doing on a Sunday? It's your day off. There's all kind of things. Why, why, I don't get it. I don't get why you sing. Your voice ain't that pretty anyway, they'll say. I don't get why you care so much. I mean, there's so many things that you could do with your life. I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't follow. I, I, and you're telling me these just Jesus stuff, but I'm just, it's just not clicking for me. We should expect that might happen. We still sow. We still say. We still share, but we can't expect that everybody's going to receive, everybody's going to listen, everybody's going to get it. We can't as, un, uh, understand that. Listen, Satan is just as busy as the church is. Satan is just as active as the most godly Christian. Satan is working harder than we are. Satan is smarter than we are. And Satan looks like sometimes he's winning and we're losing. But greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And Jesus said, on this rock I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell cannot stand against it. We are on the winning team. Don't misunderstand. Read Revelation. We are on the winning team. But we can't be surprised when Satan seems to win from somebody. Remember that Satan made sure that Eve thought, well, maybe God didn't really say. Remember that Satan 
was the best angel God had in heaven. And he took a third of the angels with him when for his rebellion of trying to be God himself, God kicked him out of heaven. And remember that Satan tortured Job and thought it was fun. Remember that that's who we fight. Remember that that's what we're up against. And we can't be surprised when Satan seems to win because we're saying something and the words are in one ear and out the other. And we're trying. And it sure looks like we're failing We're not, but it looks like we are. Listen and think with me about Romans chapter 1. You don't have to turn there. Just listen to this part. Romans chapter 1, Paul saw this at Rome. And he said this, excuse me, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. See, by their unrighteousness they are suppressing the truth. The truth about who God is, by the way, We can find that out from what God told us. God revealed enough of himself that we can understand that Jesus is the Son of God. We can understand that Jesus died for our sins on the cross. We can understand we need to live for him. We can understand he can save us from our sins. He can send us to heaven. We can understand that because God gave us a book. And God gave us what's true. But people try to push down what's true. And they do that because they're not holy, they're ungodly, they're unrighteous, they're wrong, they're evil. Paul says this in Romans chapter 1, and verse 21, he'll continue to say, Although they knew God, yeah, he's real, but they did not honor him as God. He ain't my God. They didn't give thanks to him. They didn't worship him. They became futile in their thinking. That's useless. Their thinking goes nowhere. Their thinking lands in no place, and their foolish hearts were darkened. There's no light in there. They're going to do what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it. And there's darkness inside, not light. Not the light of Jesus, just darkness instead. Now they claim to be wise, but they were actually fools. And it says all kinds of things that they did. Paul will say, God gave them up. He'll say again, God gave them up. And he'll say again, God gave them up. Listen, God is here to help us But when people refuse the help of the Lord God Almighty, God doesn't force. God will let you listen to Satan if that's what you choose to do. You should never do that. But people do that all the time. And the evil one comes, Jesus said, and he'll snatch away what has been sown in his heart. And Jesus doesn't say this. Jesus doesn't say this. But you know what I think about? Well, let me throw some more seed. You you snatch that away, birds, I got some more right here. Let me tell you another thing about Jesus. Let me tell you another thing about, and they don't listen. Let me tell you another thing, and they don't listen. Let me tell you another thing, and they don't listen. Do you know how many people have been bugged into the kingdom of God? Because their loved one, or not so loved one, wouldn't quit talking about the goodness of God to them. And at some point, at some point, the seed got sown on good soil that was ready to listen. Some point. So don't ever give up sowing the seed. Don't ever give up saying what needs to be said. Don't ever give up. Now look, don't be cruel. Don't be mean. Make sure you represent Jesus with kindness, with compassion, and with love. And look, if they don't listen to you, smile. Jesus told you it might happen like that. You're prepared. You're prepared for the fact that they may not hear, that they may not listen. Listen, these are people we love. These are people we work with. These are people we go to school with. These are people we care about. These are people we want to see in heaven. And the burden is heavy on us. And it's a sad truth from Jesus that wide is the gate and a whole lot of people that find it that leads to destruction. But narrow is the gate and it's real difficult and only a handful find it. And that's the one that leads to to life. Well, that's true. That's true that most folks do not believe in Jesus on this planet. It's a sad and true reality that God is letting Satan run around. Now, he's on a leash, but he's letting Satan run around looking for someone to devour. But we still have the words of the kingdom on our lips, and it's still time to throw those seeds out. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 
as we close. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. What does Paul, in his yet again letter to, <laughs> to the same church having problems, second letter to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 1, Paul says these words, Therefore, we have this ministry by the mercy of God. We do not lose heart. Are you tempted to give up? Are you tempted to stop talking? Are you tempted to just, I don't know if I have it in me, to say it yet again and not be heard yet again? Paul would never let that thought come to him. He would not lose heart. He would push forward. He would continue to sow and continue to sow. Because sometimes you hit good soil. Verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning. We refuse to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we just commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. This is Paul explaining, look, I was with you in Corinth for a little while. Now I'm gone. I'm writing you a letter. You remember how I was there? I just said the truth. And then if you, if you understand the truth and you understand God and you have the Old Testament scriptures and you'll see that Jesus really was the Messiah, like, I mean, I'm just telling you stuff and you can figure this out. And I'm not trying to brag on anything. I'm not trying to talk you into anything. I'm just trying to lay it all out for you. And I hope that you will understand my conscience is clear. I'm just explaining it. And I, and I don't want you to lose heart because I just, I just came here talking about what's true about God. But 2 Corinthians 4, 3, even if our gospel, our good news, is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world, little g, God of this world, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. If the seed never takes root, you can blame the bird who snatched it. He is working, Satan is, against us. And we are to keep sowing, keep sowing, keep sowing. And we shouldn't be surprised when it looks like they got a blindfold on. Because somebody put the blindfold there. His name is Satan, and he's good at his job, unfortunately. But we are still going to never lose heart, like Paul said. We do not lose heart. He said, even if they don't figure it out, even if they don't understand it, even if they can't see it, it's still true, and we're still going to say it. Again, verse 4, he said, look, they can't see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What's the gospel, the good news? God is real. He made you. And He made us in the image of God. That's true. We sin, we're selfish, we do wrong. We know what we're supposed to do inside. It's just an internal thing that we already know. God gave it to us. It's called a conscience. And we know what's right and wrong. And we just like to do wrong. That's true. And that sin is rebellion and it needs to be punished by God if he's going to be fair. That's true. And we deserve punishment for our sins. That's true. But praise be to God, he sent his son. His son came with no sin. His son came and lived the life we were supposed to live. His son came. His name is Jesus. And he shared the light of God's glory into this place, including in his parables. The light. And it's glorious light. It's life-changing light. And if you ever see seed take root in some good soil, if you ever hear a testimony of somebody who says yes to Jesus and their whole life is changed, you will get fired up about sowing. Because when you sow, and you just never know for sure what's going to happen, so many times they say no, so many times they're not interested, so many times the light bulb stays off, it does not turn on. But I keep sowing, and I keep sowing, and I keep sowing, because I'm not going to let Satan win. He'll do work, but I'm still going to keep going, still going to do what I'm supposed to do. And if Jesus did it, and didn't have positive results always, the least I can do is keep doing it and not be surprised when things go a certain way.